when we think of the world female rights, then many of the men sitting in this room today will question why do they even matter? It is a man's world after all. And perhaps you might have been right in 1925, but not today, not today, my friends, because for our mothers, for our daughters, and also for our wives, which we love, it is imperative that we discuss the issue of female rights all over this world today, especially after the old order of Britain, the United States, and France has been overthrown by something that nobody could have ever expected. A new order with one hegemon in the West and another hegemon in the East. So without further ado, let's discuss women's rights nation by nation. The Deutsche Kaiserreich. For a nation which prides itself on conservative Prussian glory, the Deutsche Kaiserreich does have a decent track record once it comes to female rights. Until just a few years ago, the SPD, the Sozialdemokratische Party, used to lead the German parliament, the Reichstag. And under the SPD, women's rights was a very sensitive issue. Women in Germany enjoy excellent right to work, right to have an education, and all of the other rights that can be expected from a gentlemanly first world country like Germany. This is also true of all the other countries which are in the German sphere or which are indirectly linked to Germany, but in slightly varying scales. Scandinavian countries, all of the Scandinavian countries, especially Finland and Sweden, but to a lesser degree, Norway and Denmark have excellent women's rights. Denmark doesn't have human rights, but Denmark does have women's rights. The Danish parliament has been abolished and replaced with an authoritarian constitution. But this does not mean that social rights have also been crushed. Then we move on to the Netherlands, which is a strong pro-German democracy led by the Social Democrats. Once again, great human rights, great women's rights. In the Kingdom of Flanders and Wallonia, uh, there is a bit of a conundrum. The Kingdom of Flanders and Wallonia, being in Western Europe, obviously has better female rights than most of the world. But since it focuses so much on monarchist Catholic doctrines, the ultra-Catholics there, there is a clique of ultra-Catholics who do not want equality for women. But these are not really dominant in the government because King Adalbert's constitution under Dr. Albert Bombs is more pro-German than ultra-conservative. Despite that, the ultra-conservatives do hold some sway. In France, Fyodor I Bock's government has one single and simple way to govern France. Govern it as though it were a military camp. Neither women nor men have much rights, and France is effectively under a military occupation, a state governed by the Reich, <coughs> by the Reich's army. Switzerland has great women's rights. The Kingdom of Spain, once again under the Germans, has, um, let's just say, some conflicting opinions on women's rights. On one hand, it is a Western European country in the German sphere, but on the other hand, the Catholic Church is quite strong. Women in Spain still face a lot of issues when it comes to getting education. And many Spanish employers will not give you a job in male-dominated parts of the sector if you are a woman. The same goes to a lesser extent in Portugal, which is a very conservative country. Italy is divided. Despite being under the Social Democrats, Northern Italy has great female rights. Well, southern Italy is still very rural and agrarian, especially in Sicily, where women are treated pretty much almost on par with how they are treated in nearby North Africa, which has abysmal women's rights. Although the Algerian Republic does have a great track record of decolonization. England, under Nicholas I Falkenhorst, Fra Scotland, Wales and Ireland have good women's rights. But once again, England is a German military council just like the French. So Britain and France really don't have rights for anyone. There is no distinction between a man and woman. So 
I can joke that both of them have equal rights for men and women, that being none. The United States of Greater Austria is an anomaly, a nation that many people predicted would fall, but it never really fell. Today, the United States of Greater Austria is just like the old United States of America in that parts, different parts of the empire have different laws governing it. However, there are some issues that are federal. And one of those issues is women's rights. Whether you, whether you are a German peasant woman from Innsbruck or a mountaineer from Transylvania or a bandida from Croatia, or if you are the daughter of an industrialist from Bohmen and Maren, most Austro-Hungarian women enjoy moderate rights. Despite this, Austria-Hungary or the United States of Greater Austria is a very conservative country. The same goes to all of the German dependents in Eastern Europe, which contain Poland, Ukraine, Belarus, the Kingdom of Lithuania, and the United Baltic Duchy. Romania has no rights for anyone because it is ruled by the Iron Guard. Bulgaria, once again under Alexander Stamb uh, Stambolisky, has moderate, moderate female rights because he is quite a progressive when it comes to social issues. But then Stambolisky is also quite conservative by European standards. And so Bulgaria is somewhere in the middle. In Serbia, Stojalinovic's government is extremely conservative, and Fan Noli's Albanian government is also conservative. The Kingdom of Greece under Georgios II does have decent female rights, especially because Georgios, when he was in exile in Germany, took a particular interest in social reforms. Then we come to the Osmanoglu family, the Ottoman Empire one of the world's largest empire, which is also indirectly the ruler of Egypt via the Khedive. The Ottoman Empire has a very bad track of women's rights. It is led by the ultra-conservative Caliph Ahmed IV, and especially in its far-off territories like Fizan, Kairanaika, or Yemen, or Arabistan here, they have very bad female rights. Women, outside of proper Turkey are treated as the property of their husband. In Turkey itself, the condition is better than it was before. But compared to Europe, women in the Ottoman Empire are second-class citizens. The same goes for Jabal Shamar, Muscat, Persia, Azerbaijan, or Georgia. Although Georgia's progressive government under Yevgeny Gegechkori does have a good track record of improving women's rights. Russia under General Pavel Bramont Avalov is more concerned with rebuilding the country that he captured with the help of the Germans after defeating Savinkov's hordes, rather than giving away rights to women. African countries like Liberia, the Gold Coast, Nigeria, Kenya, Ethiopia, Somalia, and the German Allying Republic of South Africa have. Uh, Decent female rights compared to Africa in the 19th century, but nothing really compared to Europe. Middle Africa. <laughs> in Middle Africa, the native women have absolutely no rights. They cannot own property. They cannot even be treated as citizens because natives are still treated as subhumans by Fritz Kolbe's government. The Kaiser, while... The Germans have good female rights in Germany. They treat Middle Africa like their own colony. But really, who would have thought in the 19th century when the Germans were only reserved to small parts of Namibia and East Africa that one day a huge Middle Africa would consume most of Africa? Nobody. In the Japanese Empire, the issue of women's rights has been pushed back in favor of the issue of Japan becoming the hegemon of Asia. After repeated wars against the Germans, the Entente, and even the Reds and the Americans, the Japanese have defeated a all of them, even the Russians. When Russia collapsed, Japanese armies under 
Oi Shigemoto and of course the Japanese imperial armies invaded Russia in the name of quote unquote liberating Trans Amur and the Siberian peoples. Some Japanese dependents, especially the Islamic State of Afghanistan and Pakistan, are some of the worst places in the world to be a woman. For in Afghanistan or Pakistan, women are treated as properties of men. They have to be wailed at all times. Sharia law gives them no rights and Mavdudi and Habibullah Kalakani's governments prefer a very perverted version of the Quran which doesn't really obey the actual Quran but goes about Devbandi Islam, a radical strain of Islam which calls for total jihad against all its neighbors. The only reason the Japanese agreed to Maududi's demands for such a big Pakistani state is to divide the Hindus and Muslims equally so that they may never pose a threat to Japan's pan-Asian hegemony. India has decent female rights, but under Jaduna Chima's Hinduist government, women are expected to be good mothers and good wives rather than be good citizens. The same goes for the conservative monarchies of Nepal and Bhutan. And to a lesser extent, the same goes for all the other Japanese dependents, like the Kingdom of Burma, the Republic of Siam, the Kingdom of Lanzang, Vietnam and Cambodia. Although the Kingdom of Burma is itself ruled by a woman, Mya Paya Lat, Queen of the Burmese, she still doesn't give women rights equal to men. Women in Burma are still not allowed to work in factories. The same goes for Philippines and Insulindia. In Insulindia, Sukarno has shown a progressive strain. However, he is hamstringed by the Japanese overlords and the conservative Muslims of Jakarta. And in Sarawak, women have no civil rights. Then we come to China. In the state of Manchuria, all the Manchus are treated like second-class citizens by the Japanese overlords, while Yang Yuting is contained to sit in his palace in Harbin and smoke hashish all day. In the small reform government of China, which the Japanese have established in Beijing, as their own perverted form of China, Tang Shaoyi's government is surprisingly progressive to be a member of the Japanese sphere. For Tang Shaoyi does believe in Sun Yat-sen's principles, and women have decent civil rights compared to the rest of China. The Kunming government under Tang Jiao has never really paid attention to social issues because it is completely busy fighting the other warlords fighting a cold war with, uh, with the Japanese puppet governments, a major Asian war may occur at any moment. And the only thing that is stopping Tang Jiao is the fact that if he dares to attack Japan, then he must contend with being attacked on all sides. His only hope is that the Tibetians, the Ma's, the Mongolians and Xinjiang will probably come to his aid. But that is a vain hope, at least in this decade. Jingjiang in particular is a very bad place to be a woman because Jin Shuren's brutal authoritarian Chinese government crushes Muslims. Muslim men are tortured, killed, murdered and abducted and Muslim women are often taken as prostitutes in various Chinese camps. This along with Pakistan and Afghanistan makes this whole circle one of the worst places to be a woman in the entire world. Then we move on to the Americas. The Americas were liberated with, Ger with German help. After the combined syndicates of America unified America, the Ger General Douglas MacArthur sought help from the Germans and the British exiles, and together all of them led a campaign. To the surprise of many, the Reds fought bravely, but their entire army fell apart like a pack of cards. The United States of America was liberated and then MacArthur stepped down like Cincinnatus and allowed democracy to flourish. Henry Wallace's government is one of the best places in the world to be a woman because it is quite progressive. The same goes for New, for New England, which was established by the Germans. 
In fact, New England is ruled by a girl. Oh yes, your girl, Frances Perkins, the social democratic progressive. New England is the single best place in the entire world to be a woman. If you are a woman, then you need to be in New England. New England is the polar opposite of Pakistan or Afghanistan. Similarly, Canada under James Shaver Woodsworth is a good place to be a woman. Central America is... Oh, before we come to Central America, another reason which makes the USA a good place to be a woman is that MacArthur did not abolish the, the progressive social laws that were instituted by the communists. As a result, racial discrimination and female rights have been abolished by the communists and they have been maintained by the new American government. Mexico, Central America, Cuba, and Haiti are once again good places to be a woman. Central America in particular is a socialist government under Silverio Ortiz, which may be attacked by the Americans at any moment, but women's rights, the cause of women's rights in this agrarian of states has been advanced by the communists. Panama has abysmal female rights and so does so does Chile. Despite Chile being syndicalist, it is a war-torn region. The same goes for Argentina and Paraguay, which are all communist countries. But the constant specter of war and the communist mass purges have left the entire region a very pathetic place to be a woman. There are hundreds of rapes because of the ongoing war in South America daily. In Brazil, if you are a woman in the South, then you are at danger of being murdered or raped, but if you are a woman in the rest of Brazil, then Brazil is a very progressive government under Carlos Coimbra da Luz. The same goes for Bolivia and Peru, which are all social democratic states, and Colombia and Venezuela. Bataan Court in particular has one of the most progressive constitutions in all of Latin America. Meanwhile, the same cannot be said about Suriname or the Caribbean state where women are not really treated as equals yet and the national populist government does not give even basic human rights to its citizens. Suriname and the Caribbean state, however, are client states of the Japanese. And Hawaii has, again, some decent female rights, although Hawaii may not survive this next decade. In general, America, North America is the best place to be a woman, followed by South America, followed by Western Europe, Eastern Europe. And surprisingly, independent Africa like Nigeria, Kenya or Somalia is overall a better place to be a woman than Asia. But in Asia, the best places to be a woman are probably the reform government of China, the Kunming government, Insulindia, oh, and another moderate place to be a woman is the Republic of Australasia. In 1936, nobody, has expect, nobody had expected that the Japanese colonial empire would one day spawn from the North Pole all the way to Antarctica. Yes, they do have some bases in Antarctica, but that is a reality. The Japanese assault on Australia was so strong and so fast that before anyone knew it, Australia had fallen to the Japanese. The Japanese overlords believe uh, they behave in very idiosyncratic ways. Sometimes Charles Weiner Brooks' government have a lot of rights. On other times, the Japanese like to micromanage the economy, micromanage social issues. And one of those things has been that females or girls or women in Australasia used to have greater rights before but now their rights have been severely curtailed. The conservative government of the Japanese and Brook believe that women should be good mothers and Australia should be a land of brave farmers and landowners. And that is the state of the world today. A world in flux, a world dominated by the two hegemons of Berlin and Tokyo. And once that titanic struggle begins, then who knows what shall happen. But nobody really wants another world war.